Welcome to FACT's webinar called Farm Loans and Lending, How and When to Use Debt to Finance Your Farm Business. Our presenter today is Andy Larson of the Food Finance Institute based out of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I am Larissa McKenna, FACT's Humane Farming Program Director, and I will be moderating the session. So thank you all for joining us. Let me take a, a minute or two to do just a few quick introductions uh, before we dive right in. Uh, Food Animal Concerns Trust are FACT. We are a national nonprofit organization, and we work to ensure that all food producing animals are raised in a humane and healthy manner. Uh, we accomplish this by supporting humane farmers. Uh, by promoting policies that make food from animals safe and healthy to eat, and then also by uh, helping consumers make inf informed food choices. I direct FACT's Humane Farming Program, which works with livestock and poultry farmers from all across the country, and we offer grants, scholarships, personalized materials, mentorship, and of course, webinars on many different topics. So we are currently accepting applications for both our Fund a Farmer grants and our Humane Farming Mentorship Program. So please visit our website at foodanimalconcernstrust.org forward slash farmer to learn more about these opportunities and all of our other farmer services. At this time, I am delighted to introduce our guest presenter, Andy Larson. Andy is the Farm Outreach Specialist at the Food Finance Institute at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Andy has expertise in strategic farm business and marketing planning, farm financial statements and projections, agriculture, agricultural credit and loan structure, loan guarantees and credit enhancements, among other things. He also raises a flock of pastured laying hens with his family. It's a pleasure to have him back with us today to share his experience and his expertise on this fascinating topic of farm loans. <laughs> so without further ado, I'm to, you, that's right. I'm going to turn the floor right over to you, Andy. So you may begin. So take it away. So, thank you very, very much. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> the fascinating topic of farm finance, right? That's uh that is uh, Larissa being generous, but I hope everyone is at least mildly fascinated by the time we get through this. It is a self-selected group, so I'm assuming you have uh, questions and concerns about this topic area. I am going to have to leave my uh, video off. You saw it on there with me all pixelated and glitching out. I'm coming at you from my basement suite here in uh, northern Illinois, southern Wisconsin. Um, my kids are home with a COVID quarantine from their school. So I am here as well, uh, but thank you for joining us for the webinar. Uh, I am part of the Food Finance Institute. We exist to help food and farm entrepreneurs raise the money they need to grow their businesses. That's our entire point. Um, we're part of the UW's Institute for Business and Entrepreneurship, which is also where the Small Business Development Center is housed in Wisconsin. So we're a sister shop to them. Sarah on the left is our interim director. She works with uh, food systems, food hubs, food um, uh, nonprofit kind of clients. Brad there in the middle uh, works with food brands and consumer packaged good companies. I am the farm guy. I'm there on the right. Um, I work primarily with farmers, conventional and unconventional, but I would say the majority of my customers are sustainable, organic, regenerative, uh, whatever you want to call it, selling into niche and specialty markets. So that's where uh, most of my time is spent is doing consulting with those types of farms. This is my wife and my chickens. Um, I grew up on a little farm uh, near here, near the Illinois-Wisconsin state line. And uh, in college, I decided I'd try to figure out how agriculture, natural resources, and business could be kind of strange bedfellows, uh, coexist and sustain one another. Uh, came out with an MBA and a minor in sustainable ag, worked as an extension educator on the business and marketing side of small farms and local foods, and then a number of years as an ag banker as well. So some of what I talked to you about today is going to be drawn specifically from that experience in the bank. Um, in 2014, my wife and I started this little poultry farm. We produce free range brown eggs for local markets, uh, primarily restaurants and retail stores. We're super little. We are only about 600 hens in the height of the growing season, 300 in the depth of the winter. 
Um, but we probably still wrestle with a lot of the same questions and concerns that you guys do, even if you have a larger scale farm. Again, I want to lift up this, I know, is not the kind of stuff that you got into farming for. Uh, this is sometimes outside of people's comfort zone, but at the very least, uh, you're determined to gain a better understanding of finances because it's important in the pursuit of your farm sustainability. So uh, thank you for being here and thank you for taking the time and attention to figure out some of this stuff. So today's agenda, in a nutshell, um, we're going to be talking about four different kind of general chunks today. We're going to talk about how to choose a financial institution and specifically a lender. We're going to talk about the information you need to bring to your bank the first time around when you want to start a lending relationship with a financial institution. We're going to talk about the five C's of credit decisions. We'll tell you what those five C's are. They're different than the five C's of diamonds, just so you know. And how do you get into this? How do you break into this as a beginning farmer? Um, just whenever I say bank, I'm also including bank adjacent type of entities, uh, credit unions, farm credit, uh, those kind of things. And we'll talk about some alternatives to banks as well towards the end of this presentation. So just know that when I'm saying bank, I'm including those in the, in the fold. I'm trying to advance Larissa and failing miserably. There we go. <laughs> okay, so um, I put this slide on because people just have this sort of visceral reaction to the prospect of going into debt, quote unquote, going into debt. They've they've probably just heard horror stories uh, in their in their lives about you know repossessions or bankruptcies or farm auctions that kind of stuff. Um, maybe some of y'all came of age when some of the big banks in our economy were causing some problems. Um, all that said, you probably don't hear very many tales of the loans that went right. You know, good news doesn't always make the papers, right? So, I mean, mortgages sometimes get paid off early. Uh, bankers oftentimes have your best interests at heart. There's, there's really a lot of positives about uh, this kind of relationship, relationship as well. And I mean, fundamentally, debt is just a tool. Um, it's neither good nor bad in and of itself. It's just a matter of whether or not it's used properly, just like any other tool. If you can surround yourself with a team of peers and advisors that are going to help you make uh, smart credit decisions, I'm thinking like a banker, a CPA, tax accountant, uh, an attorney, um, and maybe even a whole bunch of other farmers, perhaps, who have uh, learned in the school of hard knocks and they know where the landmines lie. Uh, those are all useful people to have on your side. Um, when, when you think about having a loan, think about it like you're paying rent on an asset. Um, interest is just rent on an asset that your business needs to function at peak productivity and peak efficiency. So you're, you're renting money. Um, a lot of you out there probably rent vehicles or uh, equipment or facilities or farmland that help you farm better. And a little extra money when it's deployed appropriately can help you farm better too. So as you guys who have been with us before, uh, you know that I'm kind of a stickler for terminology. This is some really, really, really concise definitions of some terms I'm going to use over the course of the presentation today. And I want everybody to be at least a little bit familiar. Um, when I'm talking about financing, that's a broad term and it's any kind of funding for an enterprise. It's not just loans. It can come from cost shares. It can come from grants. It's all financing. Equity is your ownership position. Also happens to be a livestock auction in Monroe, Wisconsin. But um, in this situation, we're talking about a percentage of an asset that you own. That's your equity position in that asset, be that farmland or farm equipment or anything else. Collateral, that's the assets that are securing your debt. Those are the things that the bank gets to take back and sell if you don't make good on your promises to pay your loans. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a little while here. A lien is simply a legal claim on an asset or assets. Um, a mortgage is a type of lien on a farmland. Um, a, uh, an ag security agreement 
is a lien on your non-real estate assets. We'll talk about the, both of those things more in the not too distant future. Speaking of non-real estate assets, you're going to hear me say a stupid word, um, chattels, not to be confused with cattle. Uh, chattels are is a general piece of terminology for non-real estate assets. So that's your tractors, that's your livestock, that's your processing equipment that's essentially anything that's not tied down. Um, those are your chattels. Default means you have broken your promise. You have uh, done something that your loan agreement said you would not do. Um, that is not necessarily the end of a banking relationship. It is just the instance of a problem that you have to remedy. And last but not least, a, a couple, of, uh, couple of times today, we'll talk about this one. A guarantee, and it is spelled with a Y for some reason in banking. I have not figured out why. I haven't figured out the etymology of that. That's essentially when a third party promises to help make a lender whole in a collection situation. So if you default, uh, if you go into bankruptcy uh, and you can't make good on your loan, if someone was a, a guarantor, that guarantor can be on the hook uh, for help making the, the lending institution whole in that situation. We'll talk some more about those possibilities shortly here. All right, so the, the first thing that I, I said with the description of this presentation is I'd help you figure out when to consider getting an ag loan. I, I, trying to get yourself into an ag loan is not the first thing you should do on your, on your agricultural journey, uh, if you will. Um, I'm doubting that many of you would give someone with no experience a loan to open a machine shop or a grocery store. Um, farming specifically, and I guess entrepreneurship in general, is not for everyone. Uh, so it is worthwhile to cut your teeth farming and making management decisions on a small scale or even on someone else's dime and someone else's operation. It's, it's always nice to make your uh, your initial mistakes, small, frequent, and on someone else's dime. <laughs> um, it seems like learning the production side of farming is where everybody really wants to begin, but it's management and it's marketing that are, are really able to separate the wheat from the chaff. Um, those decisions have to be strategic. They can quickly make or break a farm business, even if you're a, a fantastic producer. If you're a fantastic producer and you got great stuff, but you can't sell it and you can't make overall decisions regarding the shape of your business, um, you're probably not gonna be in it for long. And record keeping will be the backbone of making these good decisions. Um, so please do have a record keeping system in place for accounting and finance. Um, another thing that is pretty essential is throwing in a little bit of your own personal money I mean, in addition to, you know, just the simple sweat equity um, that you're going to provide uh, no matter what, because <laughs> you're going to be working in the heat, uh, a little bit of your own money throwing in is going to demonstrate commitment to the enterprise, okay? It's going to start building some financial equity on your farm balance sheet. You're going to have some an ownership position in something. Um, hopefully, even starting on a limited scale, you can demonstrate that you have a potentially profitable business model. And with a, you know, a loan to help you grow, you should be able to shoulder the burden of payments uh, as long as they are structured appropriately. Once you got a couple of seasons under your belt, you've worked out the basic kinks in your management and marketing to be as efficient as possible with what you've got, that's when you might see the opportunity to pursue a loan because you've got an opportunity to grow your business. You've got a, a big customer that wants you to start providing to them, or you need an, uh, an additional vehicle, or you need additional working capital. That's the time when you really want to start exploring your option for farm loans and lenders. Uh, when capital is your rate limiting step, that's when to start going after a loan. We'll talk a little bit more about this type of stuff when we're talking about beginning farmers as well. The other thing that you need to know when you're going after farm loans is essentially what farm loans look like. Um, there's kind of three big buckets that I would say farm loans fit into particularly well. And there's a, don't get me wrong, there's a bazillion loan products out there. They all have fancy names. Um, but they're not generally anything new under the sun, so to speak. They're kind of a, 
um, a recycled product with a slightly different, you know, set of terms for a slightly different, for a slightly more specific uh, uh, customer. Um, so anyway, I think these three buckets will kind of uh, describe most of the loans available to you and also line up with the, the balance sheet categories that we talked about in a previous presentation. So short-term loans and lines of credit are really designed to provide working capital, operating capital uh, for a farm business. The difference between a loan and a line of credit, and I should make that plain, sorry, I need to wet my whistle here, um, is that with a loan, you get the proceeds all up front and you kind of spend them down as you need them, but you're paying interest on that entire amount uh, that you've borrowed. Lines of credit, get you into a credit availability, but they don't push all the proceeds into your checking account right away. You basically advance loan proceeds as you need them. You know, if you're putting in a crop, it's as you buy seed, it's as you buy fertilizer, you know, anything like that. Um, and you only accrue interest on what you have advanced, not on the entire line of credit. So uh, that's the kind of benefit with that. Often these short-term loans are expected to be paid down or paid off that year once you sell that season's crop or livestock. They're generally secured with a UCC filing. UCC stands for Uniform Commercial Code. That filing goes to your Secretary of State. Um, it's often a what they call a blanket ag security agreement. Um, We'll talk about what that is, but it's essentially saying the bank is using your non-real estate assets, your chattels, right, as collateral for this loan. Um, but it all could, also could just be a lien specific to the, the crops that are growing in the ground or, or whatever. More, more on that uh, to come here shortly. Intermediate term loans are kind of in the two to 10 year category, and they're used to buy, you guessed it, intermediate term assets for the balance sheet, farm machinery breeding livestock, titled vehicles. Um, it often, the, the amortization period of the loan often depends on the useful life of the asset being purchased with the loan proceeds. So different types of assets have different, um, different useful lives according to the, the maker's table, MACRS table. Like a, 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 um, a consumer vehicle usually has about a five year useful life according to that table. Um, Everything has it uh, pretty specific, uh, depending on the category that it falls in. So banks generally don't make loans with an amortization that's drastically longer than the, the depreciating period of that asset, because why would you want to continue paying off something that, you know, has already been used up and discarded or sold or traded in or whatever? These loans, these intermediate loans are often secured by a secretary of state filing as well. Um, could be part of the blanket security agreement. Sometimes it's a specific description, a specific VIN, a specific serial number, whatever. And the big category on the bottom is long-term loans, ranging anywhere from 10 to 30 plus years. There's only one loan that I know of that goes for more than 30 years, and that's through the FSA. It's an ag real estate loan. We can talk about that if you'd like to. Um, but these are used to purchase real estate sometimes used to finance real estate improvements. Like if you're, you know, if you're building a shop and it's a big old expense and it's going to substantially add to the value of the real estate, oftentimes a mortgage will be used to, um, to do that. And they, these are almost always secured by a mortgage. Again, I know of maybe one instance where um, a long-term loan is secured by something other than a mortgage. Um, and if you're interested in talking about fixture filings, I don't know a ton about it, <laughs> but it's basically a county-based lien against a, an improvement on a piece of real estate. So that's short-term, intermediate-term, and long-term loans. All of those crazy different uh, uh, loan products that you see out there are some derivation of one of these three categories most of the time. Andy, can I ask you a, two quick questions before we move on? Okay. Uh, we had a question that came in. When should you request a loan versus a, I assume, short-term loan versus a line of credit? Mm. Um, line of credits imply, a, lines of credit imply a little bit more uh, history and trust with a financial institution. So I can't think of too many instances where a, 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 
loan is going to be more beneficial than a line. It's just the way that a bank might get you introduced, like might get you onboarded into their uh, into their credit department. Thank you. Okay. I think the other question was answered through the chat. Okay. Cool. Cool. So um, if you haven't noticed, as you've been out there driving around in your neighborhood, wherever you are in the United States, there is a boatload of banks out there. They're like Starbucks. They seem to be springing up on every corner in every big box store. I mean, there's just banks freaking everywhere. Um, but they all have their specialties, okay? Or at least things that they feel most comfortable with. So how do you even begin narrowing down those possibilities of where you want to go to if you're trying to get yourself into an ag loan? So there's two things that I generally do. One is super silly. Um, I'll go on to Google Maps uh, if I'm uh, unfamiliar with the, uh, the geography that, I'm, that my client is in, for example, and I will zoom out away from the farm just enough to see what the surrounding towns are. And then I'll look at the banks located within those towns. There's generally a link right to their website from Google Maps. I'll go onto their website and I'll see if they have a page for ag loans. And usually there, it's a separate page. Sometimes it's under the business loan section. Not every bank has an interest in doing agricultural loans. Um, so it could be the bank that you've been working with your entire life, or maybe it's not. Uh, more about that uh, very shortly here too. Um, but yeah, you can get yourself sort of an introductory list of the banks in the area that might take you on as a, as a farm lender. When I'm getting a little bit more serious about it, and I really want somebody that's got uh, some boots on the ground uh, experience with the local lending scene, I'll call up the loan manager at the local county FSA office. The FSA is the Farm Services Agency. I'll mention them a number of times today. Um, they're a federal agency that makes agricultural loans directly, uh, but it also guarantees ag loans that are made by commercial banks. Remember that gu the guarantee is that promise to make a bank whole in a situation where a loan goes sideways. The local loan manager in that county generally has had pretty extensive dealings with at least a handful of the area banks that make loan to farmers. Um, oftentimes, they might even be able to make a recommendation for a specific loan officer with a, you know, a, a breadth of experience in the type of specialty that you operate in. So if you're looking for dairy, if you're looking for beef cows, if you're looking for poultry, uh, a lot of times you'll be able to find a loan officer specifically that has some experience in those uh, in those areas. And getting those names off of somebody like the FSA means that that person tends to have a relationship with the FSA. And that's a good thing, especially if you're a beginning farmer. More on that in a few here. Okay, choosing a lender. Um, for a farmer... This is really kind of an important life decision, or at least financial decision. Um, and just like any important decision, it's worthwhile exploring your options before settling on the one that suits you best. Um, like I mentioned before, the local bank where you've always had your checking account or whatever, it's not always the best option. Um, that's consumer banking. Uh, consumer banking has got deposit accounts, it's car loans, home mortgages, etc. But then there's another whole separate side of banking, which is the commercial side, which is where agriculture lending resides. So it's farm lending, it's small business, it's CNI, uh, CNI is commercial and industrial lending. Um, so you generally want a bank that's got some pretty good experience with agriculture and small business lending if you're going to choose them as your partner in agriculture. So. None of this is to say that having a going with the bank that you've always been with can be useful because you have that existing relationship. You're a known quantity. Maybe your whole family is a known quantity because they've always resided in that area for since time immemorial, right? You have a history and you have a reputation that precedes you for better or for worse, depending on who you are. And if you or your family members are kind of in that um, 
mover and shaker category in the community, that bank may do whatever it can to bend over backwards, land your business, and provide you with excellent customer service. So um, being a known quantity at an existing bank or an existing financial institution can be a really good thing. But maybe your current bank doesn't do commercial lending. Or maybe they're involved in commercial lending, but they're not involved in farm. And that's, that's fine. Um, there's no rule against having more than one financial institution in your life. Um, find a bank with an ag department. Identify who the loan officers are. Go to their website, just like I was talking about before. Try to find loan officers, if you can, that have expertise in your type of farming, or at least in the farm sector. I know a lot of the people on here are livestock people. Try to find a loan officer that's got livestock experience and not just, you know, not just row crops, for example. Um, yeah, go and meet with them. See if you click. It's kind of the dating game, right? See if they ask good questions. See if they're anxious to land your business um, or if they're just kind of in coasting mode. You know, some bankers are still building their book of business. Others are, you know, they're experienced. They've been at it for a lot of years. They have so many clients that they don't want to take anybody new on. That's fine. Um, but be willing to take a second meeting with a different banker who might be a better fit. Um, if you need to, go to the length of asking them for references from their existing clients. And you can follow up and see what those folks think. Um, really good way to really feel out a loan officer and what they know and how interested they are in you before you ever commit to being with that financial institution. Loan officers do move on. I did. Others have. It happens. Um, but being able to get onboarded with somebody who really uh, wants you bad and keeps you happy is a wonderful thing. Um, banks do not have to work in isolation. Okay, It's actually very useful if the bank that you're working with has existing partnerships as well with outside organizations. Okay, And what I mean by that is people like outfits that can help them spread risk or provide you with better loan terms or uh, assemble complex loan packages. Uh, so at the very least, make sure they have an existing relationship with FSA, the Farm Services Agency that I mentioned before. Um, SBA, the Small Business Administration, is also a really good relationship for your bank to have. Uh, both of these are federal entities that can help banks kind of get to yes, especially if you don't have a perfect risk profile. More on that to come. When you ultimately decide to go to the lender and pursue an ag loan, there's kind of a short stack of files that you should pull together beforehand. Um, I'll give you the punchline now. It's your tax return, it's your balance sheet, it's your projection, and it's your plan. Why do they need those four things? What are they going to do with them? So a tax return is kind of a stand-in for the income statement. Yes, I know we had a whole... Um, webinar about the income statement and why it's important and what it does. Sometimes a bank will ask for that, um, but sometimes they'll just ask for their for the uh, the tax return because it's considered sort of a third party, refereed, not borrower prepared document. So there's a certain amount of um, truth there just from the the separation of, of of church and state, so to speak. But that being said, you did provide the tax preparer with whatever numbers that they put in that thing. So it's kind of a false separation. Anyway, they're going to um, use those tax returns to determine your business income from the farm or any other small business that you own. Your other income, if you got a day job, your regular old 1040 income, right? Any revenue uh, and expenses that you can uh, show them trends for over the course of those last three years, they'll see kind of how your um, farm business is growing, what the cost centers are, etc. What you've had to pay in taxes, how you have avoided taxes, <laughs> any capital gains or losses on the sale of capital items, plus the back of that tax return will also have a depreciation schedule. So they can see what you own, how old it is, and how much of that uh, value has already been written off. So that's what they're going to use the tax returns for. The balance sheet, so we talked all about this one as well, right? The balance sheet is that uh, fancy little thing that shows you your assets on one side and your liabilities on the other side. 
why is this useful for a banker? Every banker is going to ask for your, your balance sheet. If you don't have one prepared, they're going to have you make one. Why? Because it's got some of the most important information that the banker needs. What you own and what you owe also means what's available for collateral for a loan. Okay? They can see if you've got an asset and you've got an offsetting loan against it already, or if you own it free and clear and it's available for collateral. It'll also help elucidate your working capital position. Working capital is simply the essentially cash and cash equivalents. So when people are trying to see whether or not you've got a positive working capital, they're just going to take your current assets minus your current liabilities. Whatever is left over is what you have available for working capital. All right. Um, depends on what time of year. Some people tend to get a little bit negative during the midst of the you know growing season after they've spent a whole bunch on putting a crop in. Um, but yeah, that'll all be taken into account. Balance sheets uh, over the years will be used to make uh, accrual adjustments, right? We talked about that last time, um, how those inventory changes can actually reflect cash position changes on your farm. Remember that? The other thing that a, um, a balance sheet is going to do is help a banker identify new lending opportunities. So you're going to bring a request to that lender, right? They're, you're going to say, I want to buy a, a, a tractor. I want to buy a herd of cattle. I want to buy a flock of chickens, whatever it is. Uh, but they're also going to see who you've got your home loan with, who you've got your car loan with, whether or not they can refinance that stuff and bring you into the fold in a more complete way for your financial life. Um, last but not least, they're going to be able to see what your net worth is at the bottom of that thing. And that net worth is a useful indicator kind of where you are in the financial trajectory of your life, uh, whether you're a high net worth person that has a lot of assets to fall back on, or whether you're a beginning farmer that's really just trying to build that from scratch. All right, what else? Your projection. So a projection is just what your business is going to do over the course of the next one to three years. Um, many banks will just take one year's worth um, they want to have it monthly, preferably. Uh, why do they want to have it monthly? Are you going to be able to come up with that much detail? Yeah, well, you're going to do your best guess, but that monthly projection is going to help identify cash crunches, right? If you have your revenue coming in in a vastly different time than your expenses are going out, like many crop producers, whether you're produce uh, or, or row crops, there's probably going to be cash crunches, and you're going to need uh, a line of credit or some other available credit facility for working capital. So that's what that monthly projection is going to be able to do for people. Um, it'll also influence how your loans are structured. If you don't have a banker that structures your loan so that your payments are due when your cash is flowing, then you need a new banker, right? A lot of times people who are doing um, dairy or poultry, or anything like that, they've got monthly payments that they've got to make. And that's because their revenues are coming in monthly. For folks who are only getting revenues, you know, once a year when they harvest corn and soybeans, a lot of their loan payments are annual. Uh, for those folks who have a, uh, a harvest season, like in fresh produce from, you know, maybe May to October here in my neck of the woods, Maybe most of their payments ought to be structured during those times when they're at the farmer's markets, when they're making produce sales. So all of that uh, projection stuff should influence how your loan is structured and when your payments come due. Last but not least, a plan. And I, I only say a plan and not a business plan because people freak out at the term business plan. For some reason, it is like the most intimidating piece of terminology in the universe. And eyes get glazed over and people start shaking and or go immediately to sleep as a defense mechanism or whatever. I only once in my years as a banker ever received a three ring binder with a full fledged business plan with an executive summary, a description of their marketplace, uh, their growth trajectory and their financials. One time. So you don't necessarily need to have something as polished as all that. That being said, you do need to be able to describe in words and in numbers, either verbally or on paper, your history, your experience, your qualifications, what you can do, 
what is your current business situation and what do you want your future business situation to be? What is this opportunity that needs a loan in order to create growth or change in your farm business? Last but not least, it's really useful to have great financials to show what the expected monetary outcomes are going to be as a result of this thing. Because frankly, you build a nice, well-written business plan and your banker is going to flip to the back and look at the financials first anyway. Guarantee it. Um, so that part of the business plan is really, really important. If it's not a full-fledged business plan, if it's just a stack of papers like this, and you can point the banker to what they need to see, that will suffice many times. Okay. So that's what you need to bring. Larissa, is there any questions that have popped up while I get a drink here? We had a question that might get answered towards the end about um, business income and what to do if you're just starting your farm. I don't know if that's something you'll get to when you're talking about beginning farmers. If not, um, perhaps you could address it now what to do with the business income if you i assume if you don't have much or little ah, business income. And you won't. most of the time when you're a beginner you tend not to have a, a <laughs> ton of income and that can it could be okay because what you're doing is you are starting your growth trajectory right lauren give me a little bit more detail around that in the chat pod if you will and and we'll and we'll come back to your question Okay, so what I have up on the screen, don't be intimidated by it. This is just an example of a farm finance scorecard. This is the biggest, baddest, most complete farm finance scorecard that uh, exists in the financial industry, ag financial industry. Um, this is not generally all the stuff that your bank is going to be calculating on you uh, when you when you apply for a loan. Some of it they will. These things over here on the left, the four in bold over on the left, were the ratios that I used as a banker in my small community bank. That that's what we used to build our scorecard. You know, we had a uh, a one through eight score, I believe that it was, and um, these were the the ratios that we used in order to uh, put that score together and and grade our credits. Um, every bank is going to have a slightly different set of arithmetic that they use to create a score, right? Um, but all of this is kind of a stand-in to help give them a quantification of whether or not they want to get into bed with you as a borrower and specifically try to pull off the, the transaction that you're pursuing. Um, so we used these four, the debt coverage ratio, Fancy that. That should be on the top because the bank is concerned about whether or not there's enough cash lying around to make a loan payment when it comes due. So that's what that debt coverage ratio shows, is that after your revenues minus your expenses, and we'll uh, more about this in just a minute here, um, and then your family living and all that kind of stuff, if there's still money left over, then you can make a loan payment. Okay. Current ratio is just that measurement of liquidity, that measurement of cash, that measurement of working capital for operations, right? Um, it's just current assets divided by current liabilities, uh, an important thing. A lot of banks are paying close attention to liquidity ratios right now to make sure that people have the cash to get through, especially as every price for every input and every livestock and every everything goes up and up and up and up and up. The debt to asset ratio is it's exactly what it describes. How much uh, of your stuff do you actually own and how much of it does the bank own? <laughs> how leveraged is your operation from a debt standpoint? Once you start climbing above the, you know, the 50% mark and the bank owns more of your stuff than you do, uh, that's when bankers start to get a little bit more uh, nervous about the debt to asset ratio. Last but not least, we use the collateral coverage ratio. Essentially, is there enough stuff there that we have as collateral that if this thing goes sideways, we can sell it off and get made whole? So that specific scorecardy type of thing is going to be not universal at all. That's going to be specific to the, the, the one bank that I worked at. Oh, and Lauren made some specificity here in one moment. How do you show you have business income, et cetera, if you're a new farmer? Ah, 
literally just launching and starting the operation, which is why you're in search of capital. Fantastic. Um, we're going to have a, a chunk at the end that's all about brand new farmers, but essentially it's from keeping your records and then filing a Schedule F at the tax year, at the end of the tax year. Um, so we'll talk all about that um, in just a few minutes here. But that's how you demonstrate from a third party standpoint uh, that you have farm revenues and expenses, even or, whether or not you have net income is a separate question. Um, I would recommend having a tax accountant who's familiar with farming um, because I have seen some really crappy tax returns over the years uh, that were primarily a result of the accountant not exactly knowing what they were doing. Um, it does happen. So to generalize up from that scorecard discussion, um, there's five things that banks pay attention to, and they're very widely referred to as the five C's of credit. People make different words behind those C's, but we're going to start with what I know, okay? So the first C is capacity. Some people say cash flow instead. This, it's essentially a measure of whether or not you have enough money to make available loan payments, right? It's that debt service coverage ratio. It makes sense that this is of primary importance because the whole business model of the bank rests on their customer's ability to borrow money and repay it with interest, right? Defaulted loans and collections and foreclosures and all that other nightmarish stuff that you've heard about, all of these things are very costly and generally bad for business because they're bad for the reputation of the bank. So it's in a bank's best interest not to provide their customers with debt that they cannot service. So that's when you get a no, there's usually a reason that's in your best interest that you've gotten that no. So if you hear a banker talking about your debt coverage ratio, this is what they're, they're talking about, it's your capacity. Over there on the right, you'll see they'll add together personal income, whatever you got on your 1040 from your, your day job, business income from your farm or other owned business, plus they'll add back any non-cash expenses. That's where depreciation comes in. Nobody ever writes a check for depreciation. It's a non-cash expense. So that gets added back to your, um, your borrowing capacity. Then they will subtract your current debt payments, right? Your current debt load, any income tax burden that you expect to have at the end of the year, and then an estimate of what it takes you and or your family to live in a typical year. Groceries, clothes, movies, restaurants, etc. If there's anything left on the bottom line, that's how much you have available to make loan payments on new debt, okay? There are variations in this calculation, but this is kind of the, the most bare bones version. Um, the, the arithmetic that's inherent in this equation here on the right can get a little dicey, especially for small business owners and self-employed people like farmers, because conventional wisdom tells them to minimize all appearance of positive net income on their business tax return in order to reduce their tax obligation. You hear this so commonly in the ag sector, in the small business sector. I can't show any income because then I'll have to pay taxes. I understand this motivation. I've had to write checks to Uncle Sam on several occasions, but understand that it's kind of fundamentally opposed to the motivations of your banker. A net loss at the bottom of every business tax return is not only going to detract from your debt coverage calculation, it's gonna make your banker wonder if you're serious about running a profitable business that can actually handle additional debt. So I never wanna talk about minimizing taxes. I want to talk about optimizing taxes, okay? Um, one other thing to take note of, that estimate there of the family living expenses, it is a swag. It is a scientific wild blank guess, right? And it has a tendency to get massaged a little in order to make a deal work. Um, so sometimes if a banker tells you that you have inadequate capacity, inadequate debt service coverage, it might be worthwhile to ask what they're assuming for family living costs. Different families have different standards of living. And if you can provide evidence that their estimate that they used in this equation was wrong, maybe they can adjust it. And maybe that will get you to yes. 
This argument's a lot easier to make if you can provide a written household budget, especially one corroborated by bank statements that verify the transactions, as opposed to just taking your word for it. Okay, each of these five Cs are gonna come with a credit enhancement here. And so the credit enhancement that you can see uh, on your screen is that if a bank says you still can't swing it, you might consider um, consider asking for an interest only period. Most projects that involve a loan, usually there's a ramp up, right? You gotta build something, you gotta acquire something, you gotta grow a crop with something, you gotta raise livestock with something. And so it will eventually raise your capacity to service debt, but not right away. So maybe if it's a, you know, a monthly loan and the effects, the positive effects to your bottom line aren't felt for six months, ask for a six month interest only period. I mean, just paying interest does extend your payback period and it slows your earning of equity, right? But it can also drastically reduce your cash flow obligations in the near term when you're just changing your operation to accommodate that new asset or that new strategy or that new whatever. Secondly, uh, remember when you were 16 and your parents had to co-sign on the loan for your first car? <laughs> just so the bank had somebody to fall back on with a little bit more, uh, let's call it uh, proven capacity. That can still help. Um, if you're a beginning farmer and you got minimal track record regarding income, uh, but say your parents have greater capacity, they're a known quantity with this financial institution, having them sign on as co-borrowers, or as commercial guarantors, that could potentially get you to yes on your loan request. But don't take this lightly, because if things go sideways, the bank is well within their rights to demand repayment from your co-signers, co-borrowers, guarantors. So they really are on the hook. It's not just signing on the little line to make your banker feel better. Okay, second C of credit. Capital, I like to call it skin in the game, um, but it's it's gen it's widely referred to as the down payment. So that equity position thing that I talked about before. So like with this breakfast that's pictured here on the right, the chicken's involved, but the pig is committed, right? The bank wants you to be committed like the pig. Not dead and cooked, but you know what I mean. Uh, the bank wants to make sure that in any project or transaction, it's not just their money that's at risk because that would really make it easy for the borrower to just walk away if things got tough um what this means is that a bank is highly unlikely to lend you a hundred percent of what you need to get that project or that transaction done the max percentage that a bank will lend is called the loan to value or ltv if you hear anybody talk about an ltv for example, if you probably heard of young couples that are scrimping and saving to make a 20% down payment on their first house, well, that's because banks commonly lend only up to 80% LTV on residential real estate. So that's going to vary from bank to bank. It's kind of a policy thing from bank to bank. 75% max LTV is pretty common for a lot of types of agricultural assets, except for maybe feed. Uh, feed is super perishable and it gets fed up quickly. So a lot of times banks will only lend up to 50%. Um, so yeah, if I was planning to buy, you know, farming equipment, for example, I'd expect the bank to lend it somewhere in the neighborhood of 75%. Uh, in the case of land, land is appreciating drastically in a lot of parts of the U.S. right now uh, over the last several years. So there are some financial institutions that are kind of becoming more conservative and they're only willing to lend like 65 or 70% on land because they're basically afraid that the market's gonna go back down just as quickly as it came up and they're gonna find themselves underwater. Okay, the credit enhancement. If you're unable to come up with a down payment or an adequate down payment, especially on a high dollar asset like your farmland or whatever, it may be worth bringing FSA into the transaction. So we mentioned FSA before the Farm Service Agency. It provides direct loans, uh, it provides joint loans where the FSA and the bank work together, and also loan guarantees that can reduce the bank's uh, risk and also reduce the farmer's cash into a transaction. 
Um, so for example, one of their programs is called the Beginning Farmer Down Payment Loan. In that program, the bank puts, that's a, that's a land uh, ownership program generally, uh, the bank puts in 50% of the loan and it takes a first mortgage on that piece of real estate. The FSA puts in 45% and that's a junior mortgage, a second mortgage, um, and the borrower themselves puts in 5%. So boy, it's a hell of a lot easier than getting into a 35% down payment loan, but you still need to be able to come up with that 5%. Um, the bank can then turn around and guarantee, excuse me, the FSA can then turn around and guarantee the bank's portion for up to 95% of the value of the loan for the beginning farmer. So that guarantee is, that, like I said before, it's that promise that if anything goes sideways, the FSA will pay up to 95% of the outstanding principal uh, left on the bank's portion of that loan. So not only is the bank in a 50% equity position, essentially, uh, on that piece of farmland, they also have their 50% guaranteed at 95%. So their risk is very small. And that really helps a lot of banks get to yes, especially when it's a new farmer looking to get into uh, their first piece of real estate. The downside, there's a guarantee fee most of the time. Uh, the farmer has to pay about one and a half percent of the, of, the, um, of the guaranteed amount in order to get into that transaction in the first place. And that can often be financed into the loan. So the other common way to circumvent these LTV limitations is to provide additional collateral um, until the bank, like until the basically divided over more the bank's loan amount by more stuff until the total market value of all that collateral is lower than the maximum LTV. So if you put a $500,000 loan over a $500,000 piece of land, it's 100% LTV. The bank's not going to do that. But if you put that $500,000 loan over that $500,000 piece of land, and then another $500,000 piece of land that you already own free and clear, then that's going to put them in at a 50% LTV, and they're a lot more secure with that. Let, let's dig into that collateral thing a little bit more here. Um, collateral is a thing that nobody likes to talk about. It's not pleasant. Um, so the third C, collateral. Security is what some people will call it when they don't want to say the word collateral because it sounds like a swear word. Um, so collateral is the asset or assets that the bank can take back and sell in order to get made whole if you uh, default on your loan and quit making payments. This is, um, it's generally negotiated beforehand and you memorialize this agreement with uh, a security agreement or a mortgage in the case of real estate. And that's one of those mini pieces of paper that you agree to and sign at the loan closing. Um, so ag real estate mortgages generally collateralized by the parcel you're buying, unless you pledge a different parcel or uh, an additional parcel or whatever to reduce cash down payments, as we mentioned just a minute ago. Uh, most of the other types of ag loans that are common are going to be collateralized by that UCC filing, that Secretary of State filing that I mentioned earlier. Um, that thing does detail the assets upon which the bank is taking a lien. It is a super long document because it has all of the things that a bank has the right to own or do or take back um, should you default on your loan. Um, also, it, that's the bad side of it. But the good side of it is it tends to make things kind of simple because once the bank has their arms around all your available collateral, they can do more lending for you as long as there's still an equity position in that collateral. So they're gonna estimate what all your stuff is worth based on your balance sheet, and they're gonna be able to lend based on that equity on your balance sheet. So um, one of these blanket ag security agreements states that all of your farm's non-real estate assets, your chattels, right, are the collateral for this loan. The thing that, the, so the blanket egg security agreement also means that any additional chattel assets that you buy, you know, a tractor that you pay cash for, for example, also become collateral for your loan automatically because you own it and it's a non-real estate asset. So basically the bank has the right to liquidate anything 
um, that is not real estate or a real estate improvement in a collection situation after a loan default. That's when those farm auctions of nightmare, um, those, that's when those things take place. This is absolutely 1000% a last resort. My bank has no desire to try to sell the chickens in my coop or the eggs in my fridge, right? They have no desire to do that. They don't know the marketplace. They don't know my customers. They don't know what they should charge. They probably get pennies on the dollar for whatever it is. A bank will exhaust every other resource before it ever comes to this. So don't feel like you're at risk of your banker coming onto your place and selling your stuff. That's not how it works. Okay, but the, the other thing that's uh, to be uh, noted about these blanket ag security agreements, these are the reason that it's tricky to have agricultural loans with more than one bank. Okay, because if, a, if, if bank one has their arms around all your stuff, bank two can't really take anything as collateral. Uh, so that's why you're usually um, just going to see one financial institution as the primary lender for a farmer. There are many situations where you see multiple UCC filings, Secretary of State filings for a farm, um, like with a co-op for ag inputs or with an equipment dealer or whatever. Um, but almost always you're gonna see the bank in first place. Okay, so credit enhancement here, right? If whatever you're purchasing is inadequate collateral to secure the loan that you're requesting, you can always pledge additional collateral. So if you got a decent farm truck that you own free and clear, you could pledge that. Uh, once you have the balance paid down fire, uh, far enough that you have an equity position in the, the other asset, you can request that the bank releases their lien on the truck, making it all yours all over again. You can even have other people pledge additional collateral for you if they're amenable to it. You could have your parent or your sibling pledge their farm truck as collateral for your loan. But remember, just like in the other situation, this means that the bank is within their rights to sell their truck if you don't make good on your loan. Okay, don't take it lightly. Uh, this is actually a good time to mention the SBA again, the Small Business Administration. The SBA is a federal government entity, and it is designed to help small startup business get access to the credit they need to, to, to launch, to continue operations at, at reasonable terms. But one of the things that the SBA does regularly is provide loan guarantees in lending situations where collateral is short. Okay, so just like the FSA, we're talking about loan guarantees here. Instead of 90 or 95%, these are generally 75% of the outstanding principal amount. And they'll cost you a little bit more, like between two and three and three quarters, depending on the guaranteed amount. But it's still one of those things that makes the bank feel a little bit more secure and can help you get to yes in a lending situation. I gotta move along in these Cs. These are taking me longer than I expected to, Larissa. I apologize for that. Um, character or credit history, some people say. You know, character was also, that was always kind of the, the thing, is that yeah, uh, the character of the borrower is the most important, you know, thing by which they're judged and whatnot. Uh, so that was the good old days. A lot of farm customers that I dealt with still remember that, you know. Um, if your banker knew you, knew what you were made of, um, they make you a loan, a handshake and a signature, and that was that. Uh, nowadays, credit underwriting tends to be a little bit more objective and a little bit more numbers oriented, um, but quote unquote, poor character can be a contributing factor to getting turned down. Um, so keep your nose clean, <laughs> especially in these little towns like I live in where your reputation is likely to precede you. Um, so your bank will pull a credit report on you. They do receive a score. Commercial credit usually and take that score directly into account the way that consumer credit does. Uh, but in addition to the scores, they will also provide a credit history on that report that will basically list off every loan, every card, every retailer line of credit that you've ever had, uh, or at least in the, in the, in the recent past. It uh, doesn't necessarily have all your commercial stuff on there, but it has all the consumer stuff on there. Um, It'll show late payments, it'll show defaults, it'll show forced credit card closures or collections or bankruptcies. All that stuff shows up. It follows you. That history, much more so than the score itself, 
is likely to factor in the credit decision for farm and commercial. Um, so don't accidentally omit anything <laughs> when you're telling your banker what you have to pay on a typical month because they'll be able to find it in your credit report. Um, credit enhancement, check your credit report. Annualcreditreport.com is the place to do that. Look for errors, look for discrepancies, look for collections. I've actually had two different people try to open credit cards in my name this year. So it really is worth checking that stuff out. Um, you can pull annualcreditreport.com once a year. Right now during the pandemic, you can do it as often as once a week. Um, but it's really easy to use a service like Credit Karma or even some of your credit card companies will put you um, into a monitoring situation in between those. So uh, really useful. Um, one of the other things to keep in mind, that revolving debt thing, as we discussed during our balance sheet webinar, all balances on revolving line to credits, including credit cards, including credit lines from retailers, essentially, uh, is considered current debt when banks are evaluating your debt service capacity. Therefore, large credit card balances, even if you don't have to pay them off this year, they have a disproportionately negative effect on your calculated debt service capacity. So if you can't pay off your balances, consider trading bad debt for better debt, right? Consolidate your credit card balances onto one account that's got the lowest rate or the lowest payment or whatever, or re refi, uh, refinance them onto a term debt with longer amortization, regular installment payments. Uh, you could even trade current debt for intermediate debt. Um, take out a car loan on the car that you've got paid off and paid off your credit cards. That'll help a lot. Um, personal loans, a lot of credit cards make personal loans now. Home equity lines of credit are good for those kind of things. Um, Yes, you are trading something that's unsecured for something that's secured, but you are drastically improving your debt service capacity on paper. Okay, one last C and then I'll move on here, y'all. Uh, this one's a fast one, conditions. Um, not a lot you can do about this one, unfortunately. So the overall macroeconomic conditions of the economy, um, you gotta know what to ask for. You gotta know when the time is right. Uh, so, for example, if you're a banker and someone came to you with a loan request during COVID for a movie theater or a restaurant or a concert venue, <laughs> you probably wouldn't make that loan, right? It doesn't matter who's asking. Um, that, that, wouldn't, that would be a conditions thing. The current business environment does not look good for that particular idea. Um, but not all the, that, that's a super like cut and dried example. Uh, in Wisconsin, we're the dairy state, right? Um, the last five to six years have been pretty rough for dairy farmers. Uh, prices have been low. Um, so demand has been declining too. Bankruptcies on dairy farmers are, are all too common and they're showing up in, in, in the uh, mainstream media. But despite all this, I have worked with, with a number of clients over my time here who want to start dairy farms or other you know, businesses that are dairy farm adjacent, bottling or whatever, some banks are still interested, some are not. Um, it probably has a lot to do with their in-house expertise and the quality of the plan that that potential borrower is bringing to them. So there's not a lot you can do to change macroeconomic conditions, but you can work with a banker who knows that industry. And so see our previous discussion there. Credit decisions, um, last thing on the, uh, the bank side, the traditional bank side, these things can take time, okay? Even though the credit industry is um, kind of constantly being disrupted by new firms and new technologies that are providing, you know, accelerated underwriting or very fast turnaround credit decision, uh, folks in agriculture, especially those who are new to a financial institution, and especially those who are going into a high touch, relationship oriented, old school ag bank, um, they're gonna have to be prepared for a less than instantaneous credit decision. There's an onboarding process, right? So intake, from, intake and loan approval can take a while, especially for brand new borrowers that don't have a long 
history with the institution. So the speed of the loan request from loan close from request to closing can depend on the completeness of the information that you provided initially. If you show up with all four of those pieces that we described, you're going to have a much quicker underwriting than if the banker has to come back to you, you know, five or six different times requesting additional information. The size of the request can slow it down. If it's a small request, oftentimes the officer or the chief credit uh, person can make the approval themselves. Otherwise, sometimes it has to go to the loan committee. If it's big enough, sometimes it has to go to the board of directors. If the, if the request is complex and it's multiple loans, multiple vehicles, multiple lines of credit, uh, multiple policy exceptions, multiple borrowing entities, whatever, that complexity can slow things down because you have to track everybody down and get all their information. If there's a bunch of outside legwork, if a farm has to be appraised, uh, title work, uh, guarantees through the SBA or the FSA, all that makes things take a little bit longer. Plus, there's always just kind of a pipeline at the bank. You know, if it's renewal season in Illinois, Wisconsin, that's kind of the January to March or April time frame when people are thinking about their next season's crops, it's super busy. Um, and it might take a little bit longer to get through. Or, you know, if it's a super low rate environment and everybody wants to refi their mortgage, that's another time that the pipeline at the bank can get pretty full. Okay. Any questions for me to hit on before I move on to new stuff, Larissa? Um, there were a couple. Um, one was asking, let's see, um, where to start? Uh, let me ask this question. Uh, it's more of a, I think, a personal situation, but they want to refinance their farm loan with only a portion of the land included versus the whole farm. The value okay. of our farm is at least three times what is owed, and, it, and I want to rec, um, rectify that risk. I have a commercial loan with our local bank at a high interest rate. I want to have a better interest uh, rate, but difficult finding a bank that will refin re refinance a farm. Any suggestions? Hmm. It surprises me that you're having difficulty finding a bank to refi a farm. Um, I understand how they're getting conservative, but they'll still do it. And if you've got triple the value than you do on what's the loan, if, essentially, if the bank is over collateralized, they should be able to reduce individual parcels, like release individual parcels uh, from your mortgage. So that if it's all one big piece of acreage, you can't really release part of it. But if it's multiple uh, tax parcels, they can release individual ones, or you can completely refi the loan overall and just use it. Say there's three parcels involved and you just want it to involve one, you should be able to refinance the mortgage and just involve that one piece and have those other two then free and clear. Um, but if it's a if it's just a matter of having a hard time finding the bank with interest, I'd keep I'd keep talking to additional banks. Uh, so kind of as a follow up, they, they're also asking when trying to sort out what lo loan opportunities are out there, is it best to turn to an accountant or do you need a real estate lawyer, like in the case of this refinance situation? Loan opportunities. Um, so I would say that most ag real estate lending opportunities are going to be pretty similar because all these banks and financial institutions are competing with one another. So when somebody low, lowers an interest rate, there's a good chance that somebody else is going to lower it too. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but when you know about some institution that's offering really low rates, you can use that as a bargaining chip with the institution that you're currently at. So don't get me wrong, banks don't love to refi stuff because generally it's at a lower rate with less collateral, and that means less profit and less security for them. But in order to keep you happy, as a customer, they should be able to pursue that. Uh, they should make it happen. Because if they don't, you can easily go to the next bank down the street. Uh, so thank you for that, Andy. Someone's also asking, could you clarify what a secondary market is? I think that had to do with reselling of um, perhaps of loans. Oh, the loan guarantees? Yes. Okay, so uh, there's an outfit called Farmer Mac, and there are more like them. Uh, Farmer Mac will take a, a USDA loan guarantee, right? A, a guarantee that has been made on a commercial loan for a piece of, you know, let's say, let's say it's farmland, and that bank can sell 
that guarantee for a certain amount of dollars, a certain percentage of the overall value of the um, of the mortgage in order to rebuild their lending capital. So when banks make a loan, money has to go out the door, right? And they generally have a finite amount of money they can get their hands on in order to make loans. But loans are where banks produce their profitability. So the more liquid a bank can be and make loans with those dollars, re-lend them again after selling that guarantee on the secondary market, that is a, a super opportunity for that bank to be more profitable. So the secondary market is just where you're selling these financial instruments. You've heard about the bundling and selling of home mortgages, for example. Uh, I am not a, a, a high finance whiz by any stretch of the imagination, so that's kind of the best I can do to describe it. Suffice it to say, there are outfits out there that will buy other financial instruments, and that's the secondary market. Okay, thanks for that. And one last question that came in on the Q&A um, asking, can a truck be refinanced into an FSA operating loan if the truck is used for farming or on the farm? Uh, potentially. Yeah. It, it, I mean, if it's on your farm balance sheet, it can be, con it can be considered amongst your chattel assets. So yeah, it, it's a possibility, especially if you're going to get a, a better rate or a better amortization or whatever. Um, but the FSA is conservative and they're going to be very real, realistic about exactly what that truck is worth, right? And chances are discount rates on trucks have gone up as the prices on vehicles have gotten more and more insane over the course of the last year. Okay. Um, I'm going to have to plow through a couple of things here uh, quickly because we're running out of time and I want to make sure we be get to the beginning farmer stuff. Banks are not the only option out there for lending. There are non-bank lenders for both conventional agriculture and unconventional agriculture. ARM, Ag Resource Management, FBN, the Farmers Business Network, they finance conventional agriculture. Um, ARM is more about crops. FBN is a full lending package. If you're organic, for example, you can get access to some of these other ones. Iroquois Valley Farmland REIT does mortgages and leases on farmland that is going to be uh, organically farmed or, or transitioned uh, organic. Mad Ag is similar in that they'll make uh, farmland and operating loans to uh, organic or transitional organic type of farmers. So those are possibilities. They're smaller outfits. They're slightly lower capital. They're slightly higher rate. But for someone with a less than perfect risk profile, they become really wonderful options. Dealers of specific assets like um, machinery and equipment, for example, or Crop input providers, you know, Landmark Cooperative or Conserve FS or any of those uh, input co-ops around here in, uh, around the state line, um, they will finance you for your crop inputs, for example, and say that they require payment by, you know, October, November, December, whenever it is. Um, so they'll finance you for the year. Sometimes it's at a lower rate than what the bank will. Sometimes it's at a higher rate. It just depends on uh, most of the time they do a really reduced underwriting, like looking at a credit score or something like that. Uh, same with the machinery and equipment dealers. They can make a term loan for machinery and equipment. Uh, they'll just file a Secretary of State filing on the specific serial number, and you can finance that equipment right with them without having to go to the bank. Now, the banks don't love that. If you have a primary banking relationship, the bank would much prefer to be making that interest rather than the dealership making that interest. So if you want to keep your banker happy, keep them involved with these transactions that you're going to be doing. And you can certainly pit the dealer and the banker against one another for as far as terms are concerned. Uh, last but not least, seller financing. You know, this is the way a lot of beginning farmers get into their first piece of farm ground. I, I bought my farmette from my dad on a land contract, right? My dad was the seller and I was paying my dad in installments in order to get into this farmette here where we have our poultry farm. So they don't get a lump sum up front, which is honestly sometimes desirable for them, depending on their tax standpoint. Um, but it tends to be a little bit of a, it's a relationship thing, right? You need to be family or friends or somehow close. The terms are negotiable. Believe it or not, the FSA can provide a guarantee to the seller on that land contract. So if it is an unrelated party, there is a way to get that risk spread out as well. Uh, a couple other alternative financing options. One thing that's becoming real common rate lately is capital leases. 
So a capital lease is not like a traditional operating lease. An operating lease is where you pay rent for something and that is a pure rent expense. A capital lease is a thing where you pay rent on something, but that rent at the end of the lease period gets converted to equity or some percentage of it gets converted to equity. So you're actually in sort of a, it's a convertible lease. It's a rent to own kind of situation, I guess. Um, so those capital leases uh, are getting to be pretty common as the price of uh, fancy pants farm machinery continues to escalate. And the, the amortization that banks are willing to go to doesn't go longer and longer and longer. If you want to buy a million dollar combine, it can be awful hard to pay off that thing in the space of five years or whatever amortization the bank is willing to go to. If you lease it for a while first, earn some equity into that combine and then um, get a lease to refinance the lease, get, excuse me, get a loan to refinance the lease, um, then you have your equity position built in after a couple of years of making lease payments. I put free money here in quotes. There are options right now that people think of as free money. They're not always as free as they think they are. Right now during COVID, there has been a lot of opportunity to get into really attractive term loans and grants, uh, forgivable loans, especially the Paycheck Protection Program. And I'm sorry for all the letters here. That's why I got the alphabet soup picture over here. PPP is the Paycheck Protection Program. EIDL is the Economic Injury Disaster Loans. Both of those are provided through the SBA. EIDL is not forgivable, but PPP is. Um, my farm actually got a very small PPP loan forgiven uh, this past year. So really useful program. There are grants out there. They're usually not to get into the things that you want them to be. <laughs> SARE grants are primarily for research, for example. Value-added producer grants, they're not for, you can't buy a farm with it, you can't buy equipment with it, but you can pay marketing expenses in order to enter into a new marketplace. So if you're the type of farm that's doing some value-adding to your raw agricultural commodities and you want to get them in front of a new set of consumers, then a VAPG might be a useful thing for you. They're a boatload of work. Uh, if you're going to write a VAPG, uh, either you've got to take two months off to write it or you've got to hire a grant writer. They're a lot of work. Uh, the Frontera Farmer Fund and the Chicagoland Food Shed is one of the rare um, exceptions to this rule. They will provide small grants up to $12,000 for equipment. And you can buy a piece of equipment, a piece of capitalized um, equipment that you need for your farm. My wife and I have applied for one of these things and gotten it and bought a, an egg shed with it. Super duper useful. Super local as well. There are likely to be a local opportunities around the country. Um, and I love people, if they know about them, to go ahead and throw them up in the chat. Last but not least, there are some cost shares available through NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service. They have a number of acronym -y programs that provide uh, cost share for different kinds of conservation practices. EQIP is the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. Oh, gosh, how could I have forgotten fact, Larissa? I'm so sorry. Jeez, Louise. <laughs> That's currently open, boy, smack me on my hand. Um, conservation Security Program, Conservation Reserve Program, both of those things are through NRCS. Um, yes, the Food Animal Concerns Trust does make some grants available, okay. Um, be uh, aware, keep your ear to the ground for these different kinds of small and regional types of grant programs that really can make a nice difference in a small farm operation. Okay. This is a quote on grants from Moses. Farming is a business, and like with most businesses, it is rare to receive grant funds to support operations, purchase land, or improve buildings. Those are the realm of loans primarily. However, there are opportunities for farmers to receive grant support for on-farm research, business planning, conservation, and some kinds of marketing support. This is a very true thing to take to heart. If you want to start a farm, you are starting a for-profit enterprise that is designed to improve your bottom line, your net worth, your quality of life. It's hard to get public money for that. So there are some things that fit. Take advantage of those. Make sure that you're kind of putting a square peg in a square hole. All right. Any questions before I go into the beginning farmer piece, Larissa? Because I know we're running short on time. Um, I think there's a question that might um, come out in this other section. And then there was a question from before that I 
didn't get to ask you, um, there, there's a question or a, uh, they're asking to please repeat what you're saying about, this is from a couple slides ago, I apologize, uh, reducing income because of taxes. And there was, we were talking about deductions and, um, and that sort of thing. But again, you might be talking more about that um, during this section. Okay, so tax burdens are reduced, uh, income tax burdens specifically are reduced by having less income. But having less income is also a potential burden in and of itself. So one of the things that people do oftentimes to minimize their appearance of income in a specific year is to buy something in December when they realize they're going to have a, a profit on the bottom line. Uh, that's when a lot of you know farm pickup trucks get bought, for example. Um, so by uh, purchasing something that's either um, small tools and equipment or a capitalized asset that is then straight line depreciated as soon as it's put into service, that can reduce your, um, your tax burden by reducing your appearance of income for that year. But that reduction in the appearance of income is also uh, counter to the banker's uh, motivations to show that you have a debt service capacity with your business. So be very, very careful about minimizing the amount of income that you show on any given year. It is perfectly legal and perfectly acceptable to put different kinds of depreciation schedules on different assets. You will do that with your uh, farm tax accountant, and they will take that same kind of depreciation every year for however many years you decide, or even all at once. So uh, it is perfectly plausible to use depreciation to optimize your tax burden. But be careful not to be buying stuff every December and taking out loans on it that gets you into a debt service situation that is untenable for you or for your farm. <coughs> Excuse me. Was there another one too, Larissa? There was one. They're asking, can FSA operating loan be used to consolidate debt? Uh, yes, in certain circumstances, an FSA OL uh, can be used to consolidate debt. Um, but that's a longer conversation that I'd love. Feel free to follow up with me and we can talk about that a little bit more. Um, all right, so just quick here, and I apologize, guys. I'm going to go a couple minutes over the line here. If you can stick around with me, especially if you've got a lot of questions regarding this beginning farmer question. Uh, there's a few things that I'd love to be able to kind of lay on you to think about. It's not necessarily the most, you know, it's it's not life changing or world altering, but it's it's something that you should know about if you're a beginning farmer in particular. So, where does a beginning farmer begin? How do they get in with a an ag bank in order to start their career? Well, as I mentioned in one of the, the first slides in the presentation, the loan is probably not the first thing that they want to pursue. The only times that I see a beginning farmer who's never done any farming and is straight out of you know high school or whatever, um, never filed a Schedule F, never done any of that stuff, but they come in and they get an ag loan because they're working with mom and dad, they're taking over, you know, 80 acres of mom and dad's larger order operation. They're borrowing all the equipment. Mom and dad are furnishing the fuel. And this farmer is essentially just using this as a, a vehicle to start creating a, um, a farming history and a set of farming records. I mean, that, that happens. We're, we're, it's a generational farm with generational wealth. Um, that allows the, the new person to come into the operation and get a loan right away. That's much more based on the family's farm history than just that kid's farm history. So if you're starting from scratch and you're not on family land with family equipment and all that kind of stuff, how do you get started? Well, it's a lot of, it's a lot of scrap to begin with. You got to you got to start small with what you've got. You got to lease ground, borrow equipment, lease equipment, buy old equipment, um, keep records, file a Schedule F with your tax return, 
established marketplace where you're going to sell what it is you're going to sell. If you're selling ag commodities, that marketplace is already there, fine. But if you're doing something differentiated, if you're doing a grass-fed beef product, if you're doing a value-added product, if you're doing a whatever that doesn't just go to the elevator and get dumped, you're going to have to establish those marketplaces and demonstrate to the banker that you've been developing and establishing these markets over the course of the past couple of years. Usually, you'll be able to demonstrate that you had a certain amount of cash flow because your overhead was super low. You don't own anything, right? So you're not paying a lot of utilities. You're not paying a lot of loan payments. You're, you're going to be able to show that you, if you just you know, got that 80 acres of wheat or whatever, and you didn't have any expenses associated with it, all that cash can get plowed back into the business and any profitability is probably going to get used to buy the first tractor because they don't want to show that there's a taxable income, right? <laughs> I know how this works. But reinvest in that business. If you're trying to get into a bigger asset, save for that down payment. It's worthwhile to pay a few dollars in income taxes in order to keep that 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 grand or whatever in your bank account in order to make that down payment on that first piece of ground. All right, build, all this is to say, build momentum. Start extremely small. Do what you can with what you've got and build momentum. After you've got some of that momentum, you still may or may not be in a lendable position. And there's other places aside from banks where you can get your first kind of infusion of startup capital. And it's very bootstrappy, right? You can make a loan from your own savings to your farm. Memorialize that on paper. Show how you're paying yourself back. Demonstrate that the farm has a repayment capacity. If you if you're super young, straight out of school, uh, you don't have any you, you know you don't have a 401k to borrow from or anything like that. Friends and family loans are perfectly reasonable. If you only need five or ten thousand bucks, it's honestly almost preferable because a bank doesn't want to screw around with a five thousand dollar loan. Right? It's a whole it's the same amount of work as a five hundred thousand dollar loan, and there's almost no interest made on it. So feel free to pursue friends and family loans, and it is going to keep you super honest. Because instead of you know defaulting on a loan to a bank, you're gonna default on a loan to somebody you love, right? So there's a good chance that you're not going to not make good on that loan. IDA are individual development accounts. There's certain nonprofit organizations around the country that make these available. It's a match savings account. Essentially, you put in 200 bucks a month and they put in 200 bucks a month. And at the end of you know two years, you get that full $4,800 to buy your first farm asset, whatever it is. So that's a neat thing. You can do a fundraiser on your farm. If you've got a dozen chickens, you can certainly make a nice scrambled egg breakfast, right? Have a fundraiser. Um, Kiva is kind of a, a, a global crowdsourcing small business development organization, Kiva.org. They make small farm loans. Crowdsourcing with you know Indiegogo or GoFundMe or Barnraiser, if that's still a thing, I don't even know. Um, that's an okay way to get into five or maybe seven or ten thousand bucks to kind of get you rolling. Just make sure that you're using whichever platform doesn't make you get all the way to your goal before you receive any proceeds from that loan. Um, and if anybody knows exactly which one that is and wants to put it in the chat, that would be great. Um, down at the bottom, I have credit cards in tiny print. Um, credit cards aren't a great option for getting a farm started. Um, super high interest rate. We're talking anywhere from 14 to 24 plus percent. You are never going to pay an interest rate like that at the bank. Okay. So ugh. I got to put my money where my mouth is and say, yes, when I first started rehabbing my chicken coop from my grandmother's potting shed, I put a lot of materials from Menards on a credit card. But shortly thereafter, I refied that credit card balance with an SBA loan from my local ag bank. Okay. So I wasn't sitting there paying you know, 18 or 20% interest on that $10,000 worth of, um, of building materials. And full disclosure, my wife and I also got a family loan to help us get started as far as from a working capital standpoint. Okay. Um, there's no sin in that. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just a way to kind of get you rolling. And if your family wants to support you as they often do, 
um, then there it's certainly an option to be able to use. Okay, once you're actually ready to go sell yourself to the banker, there's a few things that your banker will love to hear. If you're a beginning farmer with a short history and not a lot of net worth, these are the things that are going to make a banker smile because they still seem like you are a worthwhile risk. Point one, keep your day job. There are boatloads of farmers. As a matter of fact, the majority of farmers in the United States still do rely on off the farm income and benefits in order to cover family living expenses. Um, so keeping your day job is an option. A spouse with a day job is an option. It's regular income, right, to make a payment. It's benefits. It's all of those things that are a little bit more complicated when you're running a farm. Treat the business like a business. Make sure it has a separate checking account, uh, a separate debit card. Make sure that you charge things that are appropriate to the business and keep your records separately as a business. It's going to be so much easier to demonstrate whether or not your far farm has some profitability if your records for that are separate from your household budgetary stuff. Produce yourself a balance sheet every December 31st, if not more often. That balance sheet is going to show how you have progressed from a net worth standpoint and an asset standpoint over the course of your first couple of years of farming. It is absolutely essential to make accrual adjustments on your income statement. It's just got so many things that are important to a banker that they will love it if you can provide them three years worth of 1231 balance sheets. Know your cost of production and don't guess at your cost of production know your cost of production know what's going into the production of whatever um, agricultural commodity you're producing that is essential to know whether or not you have a profitability prospect even if you don't have profitability right now build your bank relationship early go meet bankers and take them out for coffee and donuts bankers love donuts um, before you ever need your first agricultural loan. Build that relationship. Interview your bankers, whether or not it's you know mom and dad's banker or somebody else. Go talk to them. Figure out what they're about. Figure out what they know. Use them as a resource. And then a couple years down the road, when you got to get into that first loan, you have that relationship established. They know who you are. Hell, they might be cajoling you to get into a loan before you ever ask them for it. In addition to the banker, engage another team of professionals. Have your tax accountant, have your CPA, have your attorney, have your peers. We talked about that at the beginning. Avoid superfluous debt. Don't run up credit cards. Don't, you know, buy a whole house worth of stuff on a credit card from Slumberland USA or whatever. It doesn't matter how, how good the deal is. Be conservative. Be responsible with the, um, the debt that you get into. And last, but not at all least, when you're going to the banker and you have a thing that you want to do, you have a project, you have a transaction that you want to do, have a plan. Have that plan be built on data. Data from your experience, data from third-party refereed resources, not just wild guesses. All of this stuff that I have listed here is going to make your banker so much happier and so much more likely to say yes the first time you ask them for a loan. Okay, take home messages. Choose a bank and a banker, your, lo your loan officer, based on the specialty, on their capacity for you, right, and the fit with you and your operation. Get yourself well positioned before you make that first loan request. Have your records. Know what your financial health looks like. Be open to things like FSA guarantees, SBA guarantees, credit enhancements, and alternative financing if you appear to be risky on paper. And last but not least, demonstrate that responsibility and that momentum that I keep mentioning. Beginning farmers can indeed get financed. There are programs out there. Um, Farm Credit has a beginning farmer program with relaxed uh, underwriting uh, uh, requirements. So it'll help those young people that are just getting into it get into their first farm loan perhaps a little bit earlier. Okay, so and they're not the only ones. There are other banks that are competing with them that that will they'll offer stuff like that too. Ah, Larissa, I went too long. 
I went 10 minutes over. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, I think, I mean, I think folks stuck around and um, there are, we have a couple questions If we, we might as well, since we're over, let's, let's take another two or three minutes if that's okay for folks. <laughs> that's okay for you, Andy. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you bet. And I understand if folks have to go. Everyone's time. Yeah. 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 It's um, depending on your time zone. It could be either eating dinner time or making dinner time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so let me just say, let's see, there's a question about, um, that came up in the Q&A. My, uh, my, husband, my husband and I have a transport company and he's the only driver. <laughs> so it, it might be a small company. I have a 51% interest in the LLC. Should I put profit from that company in my name if I'm the one applying for an FSA loan? FSA is not going to support a transport company because it's not an agricultural production business. Um, Does SBA it help their might case? might be a better bet. Okay, gotcha. SBA might be a better bet. And what was the question? Should I put the profit in the name of the business? I think if they're applying for an FSA loan for perhaps their farm business, but they are showing profit from another business, that's the question. Um, oh, so yeah. I mean, there is when a bank or the FSA is evaluating your capability to service debt, they're going to look at you globally, right? They're going to look at your entire financial life. And if your other business is producing a tidy profit that is some Thing for your family to fall back on in the instance that the, the farming doesn't go that great one year, that's certainly a really worthwhile thing for FSA and the bank to know. Great. Okay. Um, well, here's a question that um, came in earlier. So they're saying they're a first time land farmland buyer. I don't have any experience farming in the USA, but they do have farming experience in um, their home country. How do I get an FSA first time ownership loan? In order to get an F, so FSA does not fund land owners, it funds farmers. So if that uh, land is just to be owned and rented out, the FSA is not a viable option for a loan. If you're going to be a farmer, then the FSA generally requires you to have uh, three have filed three years of Schedule Fs with your tax returns in the U.S. Um, sometimes they will substitute those Schedule Fs with other experience that you've had farming in, you know, in other countries or in certain professional situations or whatever. Um, but generally, if you're just going to be the landowner and not the operator. Uh, the FSA is not going to do uh, a land loan for you. Got it. Well, it looks like we, we got to most of the questions. There might be a few that got lost in the, the chat. <laughs> that, <laughs> however, I will be sending out an, an email tomorrow. Let me just uh, go forward a slide that will CC Andy. So if there are things that um, you'd want to kind of follow up with them about specifically your situations, something that maybe occurred to you after um, we got through this this session, then um, you'll have that information as well. So a few housekeeping items before we sign off, a reminder that there is a survey that will pop up on your screen if you would take, I know we asking you to spend another minute on this um, just to fill it out. That would be wonderful. And a recording of the webinar and the slides will be available very soon. I will be sending them out, if not later tonight, then first thing in the morning. So look for those in your inbox as well as they're going to be archived on our website. We do have a whole bunch of other opportunities this fall and winter. Um, you can see the list of our webinars that are upcoming in, this month and then into January and February. Hopefully you'll, you'll see something on that list that appeals to you. Um, don't forget that we are accepting applications for our grants, our mentorship program, and then also our scholarships are ongoing. So if there's any events, whether that's virtual or in person that appeal to you, um, feel free to apply for some funds to attend. So I think that is all I have for ten, for tonight. Now that we've entered the dark part of the day, right? Everyone has chores to do or dinner to make. A sincere thank you to you, Andy. It's been a real pleasure to have you with us today, and then also um, earlier this fall. And somehow, you it's do been a pleasure. Always, yeah, tend to make you're able to make these technical kind of wonky topics. Um, 
you know, a little bit more fun and accessible to folks. So we really appreciate that and keeping it, you know, very full of content and yet um, entertaining. <laughs> and I'd like to well, thank we'll everyone. Well, we do at FFI, so get in touch if you need help with that. That's right. FFI is a great resource as well, and we've been partnering with them a lot this fall. Um, Thank you to everyone in the audience for your questions and sticking around. And I hope that you got something out of this. We really appreciate all that you're doing for your, you know, for your local communities, for your families, for your animals, for the environment. So um, hopefully we'll, we'll all be able to find more opportunities to connect and work together in the future. So enjoy the rest of your evenings and stay warm. Uh, goodbye for now. Thanks everyone. Good night, y'all. Thank you so Bye. much.